Mountain properties. They also want their properties that are adjacent to the Maui National Wildlife. Um, at the Bundy Ranch, we had a situation where they used the desert tortoise as their excuse. Um, they said that the desert tortoise is an endangered species and that the cattle are putting them in danger, so therefore the cattle have to leave. Um, my family has been ranching there since 1877, uh, and the, the, the turtles and the cattle seem, seem to do okay, but uh, none of that mattered. We hired lawyers, we fought it, we had scientists, we did everything we could to try to prove, and it was proven time and time again in court. And we won time and time again on those, uh, in, the, in the local courts on those issues. The U.S. Uh, prosecuting attorney stood on the steps of the courthouse building and says, um, well, for now, for now that's what the ruling is. For now. Meaning he was just going to continue to exhaust these uh, uh, efforts, these court efforts, these legal efforts, until he, until he won. That was what was his, he was saying on the courthouse. And so uh, then in 1990, uh, Right around 19, uh, the turn of 1990, right around there, the BLM came up with a slogan. And the slogan they actually posted on their, their wall in, in the Las Vegas, the Southern Nevada district. And it said, no, uh, no move by 92 and cattle free by 93. That was their slogan. And, uh, you know, here we were supposed to try to have this culture of, 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 of a, uh, you know, helping each other and so forth, and they, that's basically what their desire was. Um, they began to either regulate the ranchers, there was 53 ranchers in Clark County, and we all ranched close together, we all shared um, uh, public land, we all grazed and had our grazing rights there, and, uh, and they began to, one by one, well, you know, basically regulate. And they put regulations such as you had to remove the cattle at certain times of the year, you had to decrease your, your uh, uh, cattle count on the range, and the range down there is a lot different. Like, you don't pull your cattle off. You have to keep them on because you can't gather them. Anyway, there's a lot different condition. But these regulations were clearly in an effort to destroy the rancher's ability to make a living. And we tried to legally defend ourselves, and one by one, these ranchers were put out of business, either through duress or by actual force. And then ultimately, there was about seven or eight ranchers, besides my dad, there was about seven or eight ranchers that they finally went in and actually paid them $75,000 for their ranch, the price of a pickup. And the ranchers were so exhausted and so to the point where they couldn't stand anymore, they actually took... $75,000 for their ranch, right? And now those ranchers' children, every single one of them had to move to, to the cities. <coughs> and they don't even know where their meat comes from. Their grandchildren don't even know where meat comes from. And my dad, the whole time, well, not the whole time, he, he began, him and a, a couple of the other ranchers and, and ranchers, they began to study what was their position. How could they, how could they fight this? And, and after a, a, an exhaustive amount of research and study and so forth, they found something that was even greater than what they ever imagined. And that was in the, found in the Constitution of the United States and the reason why we passed, the, passed it out. Because they found that the federal government didn't have authority to be administrating the lands in the first place. That under Article 1, 8, 17, it says that in order for the federal government to own and control land inside a state, they first have to get consent from the state legislature. They second, they have to purchase it. And third, they can only use it for the erection of forts, magazines, dockyards, arsenals, and other needful buildings. Those are the rules that the federal government must follow in order to own land, own and control land inside a state. So ask yourself, does the land that is being controlled in your county, have they got consent from the state legislatures to control it? Did they purchase it? 
And are they using it for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings? I, I, I'm not seeing any heads. Are they? Did they purchase it? Did they get consent from the state legislatures? See, and that's what happened during, not to get too, too far out, but basically, at the moment of statehood, everything changes. No longer does the federal government have the authority to control and administer the land inside the state. It becomes the, the, the right of the people of that state to control and to administer those lands. And if the federal government needs some of that land to perform its duties, such as national defense, international trade, or being a pills court for the states, if they need some of that land to do that, they have to get consent from the state legislature. <coughs> they have to purchase it, and they can only use it for those reasons. That's it. And that, and what it did is what it does is it protects the people from what we're experiencing now. This issue with the Hammonds, this issue that you got, that all of us are experiencing in Harney County, it is a jurisdictional issue. The federal government has come down into our states and they are controlling the land and resources unlawfully. And that is, that is the argument. That is the argument. There is no other argument. If we were abiding by the Constitution, the Hammonds would never have been, would never be in the position they're in. If we were abiding by the Constitution, these ranchers would be able to ranch without being in fear. If we were abiding by the Constitution, if one of us stepped out of, line, out of line and broke a law, we would be prosecuted in a county court. And we would probably find justice there, actually. We would be tried among our peers here in the county. <coughs> right? So this is a jurisdictional issue. And if you try to argue anything, even though, even though the, the abuses are tremendous and they're grotesque, they're egregious, they are. But, and, and we can't forget that, that they happen. Don't get me wrong. But the Hammonds should have never been in a federal court in the first place. And that, and, and, and again, that is the foundational reason, or, or principle here. That is the foundational argument. And so, and it is the solution as well. The only solution that we have here, in my opinion, and in the Many, many years that I've been involved in this, I've watched my dad and, and, and ranchers for my whole life. I'm 40 years old. My, my whole life, I watched my grandfather go through it. I watched my dad go through it. And it's all the same exact thing. Uh, I could give you statistics like there's over 100,000 cases where the federal government has used their courts to take land in the West, Western United States. 100,000 cases. Guess how many of those the federal government lost? Zero. There is no justice found in the federal court system. If we think we can go run and prosecute the, the, the U.S. prosecutor in the federal court and win, we're fooling ourselves. So, um, I would like to, a lot, of, a lot of people have asked, well, why are you, if the federal government is doing this to us, us people here, then why are you being so hard on the county and the state? Why are you, why is this notice of grievance to the county and the state officials? You know, why are you basically insisting, and, and, and it's not just me, don't get me wrong, why are you insisting that the state and the, and the county hold an evidential hearing and come up with these findings. Why? What's that? It's their jurisdiction. It is their jurisdiction. It's their duty. Because we do not have a system of, we were never, uh, there is no way for redress or protection of the federal government coming down against the people. There is no protection. Except what? When the states and the counties stand and say, no, not in our county. That is the protection. It's called federalism. Our founding fathers were federalists. You might think, well, man, I don't like the word fed in that word, right? Because I know I don't. But they were federalists. Yes? How do you handle the argument of the supremacy clause, being the federal government is over everything? There's a, well, one is a, uh, how, how do I say it? A horseshit. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I hope I'm okay with quoting him about that. But but it's for every for every you know when we look at this and we go okay let's if we want to go to case law you know we can go back and we can give a hundred cases where it proves that the state has authority to and it's sovereign right and we can go in the early you know in the last 75 years we can go to another 50 cases where the Supreme Court was ruled against the state okay we can ask ourselves which is wrong and wrong here wrong. right it's right here it's very clear the the growth pattern of this country was that the that you had the states, they were sovereign, independent states, and they united together. The growth pattern is you have territories that were not states. That territory is under the jurisdiction of the federal government. And as Article 4 says, that they make all the equal rules and regulations. Okay? As soon as that territory gets populated enough to become a state, and as soon as they're enacted into the union as a state, no longer at that moment does the federal government have the right have the right to uh, to exercise territorial law. No longer does it. That now that state is fully protected under the United States Constitution, and the people become sovereign and have their rights within the state. That's the growth pattern. And if and if if we didn't have these, if, if we didn't have these. I guess wicked men, if you want to say, you call it what you want. But if we didn't have these wicked men, it's a beautiful pattern because what can happen is our territories, we can obtain land, whether, whether it was through a war or whether we purchased it. We can obtain land that could be a territory. The people can go in and begin to populate that territory and it could become a state. We could do that across the whole continent, across the whole world, right? and make free people free across the whole world. That was, that was the intent, right? But we have a situation where our federal government has turned their sights on the land and resources of the people because that's where the wealth is generated, and the states have not done their duty to check and balance, and neither have the county. So that's why this problem is really a county problem and a state problem because the federal government is just doing what the founding fathers knew they were going to do. Yes? Has anyone looked into the county or state being threatened by the feds, and that's why they won't step in? Well, there's, okay, that's a good question. Yes, they have, and remember, this is, this is, a, this is a problem across, you know, the whole country right now. And the, the main reason why counties won't stay, the, counties won't stand, there's four reasons. One is there's either corruption, um, or there's, um, there's uh, the, the county officials are uneducated, they're, they're ignorant, right? Or there's, um, it's because of funding and fear. Those are the reasons why a county won't stand up. Because yes, they are threatened. There are times when they're threatened. Um, they are funded, uh, and they're afraid to lose that funding, and they're put in undue, undue obedience. Thomas Jefferson said, if, if the found, if the founding or if the states ever allowed the federal government to come in and control their land and resources, this is Thomas Thomas Jefferson said, if the if the states ever allowed the federal government to come in and and control their land and resources, what it will do is it'll destroy the economy of the state, expose the people to the to the tyranny of the federal government, and put the state into undue obedience. Because what will happen is they the state will not be able to generate enough revenue and it'll have to beg for funding from the federal government, right? And why is that? Because they control the land and the resources. All the wealth, all wealth is generated from the earth. Everything we see here, everything in front of us came from the earth, right? And if you control the land and the resources, then you can control the people. You can control everything. And they understand this, and there's a lot of pieces to it. But I hope, hope I answered your, your question. Um, but it doesn't matter. It is the duty of the county. It is the duty of the state to stand and defend the people. And when they will not do it, then whose ultimate duty is it? It is the people's. It is 
ultimately our responsibility. We have delegated it to them. And if they will not do it, then we must. So um, any other questions or thoughts or anything that anybody else wants to add before I go yeah. on? Yes. I had two questions. First of all, you a few minutes ago you referred to Article 1, Section 8. Okay, I haven't found the specific in there. I know it's supposed to be there. Yeah. And the other is, um, what do you think of the federal government, say the BLM, owning very small portions of land, such as around Steens Mountain or Yaquina Head or, you know, parks? Do you think that they should even own that? Or? It's, it's not my opinion. Oh. The Constitution says direction of forts, magazines, and uh, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. It's not my idea. Oh. It's the Founding Fathers' idea that the federal government should not own land inside a state unless it's for those reasons, unless they have, unless they're using it, or they have got consent from the state legislature and they have purchased it. So, and the thing is, is this is one thing that we have to understand. That is the law. Right? So, how many times have we've been told we're, un, we're, we're, we're breaking the law? We're not breaking the law. They're breaking the law. This is the supreme law of the land. <coughs> and so, uh, anyway, if you want to look at that, it's in Clause 17. I can read it right here. Okay. I don't mind doing that. Okay. I've read it several times. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. Okay. And it doesn't number it in this book. So you yeah. have to kind of go down. It says, so first of all, it talks about their jurisdiction over Washington, D.C. And then it says... Uh, to exercise like authority, meaning like Washington, D.C., over places purchased by consent of the legislature of the state, in which the same shall be for the erection of forts, magazines, arsenals, dockyards, and other needful buildings. Okay? Now, to put things in perspective, when you step across, according to their view, and according to the territorial law that they are enforcing, on federally controlled land. If you step across from private to federally controlled land, then you no longer are protected by the U.S. Constitution, according to them. You now fall under what is Article 4 jurisdictional law. And let me read you what that is. It's very simple. And this will start to explain a few things to you. It's in Article 4, Section 3, and it says, this is, this is territorial law. So when you step over the line, you are no longer protected under the Constitution. This is the rule that you are protected, that, that they say uh, is their right. Congress shall have power to dispose of and make all needful rules and regulations respecting the territory. Okay? Am I making sense, what I'm saying here? You do not have any rights on federally controlled land in a territory. You do not have any rights unless Congress deems that you have a right. Because we give them power to administer, fully administer, administer territories. Okay? But the thing that I'm trying to educate and trying to uh, you know, help understand is that we do not live in a territory. We live in the state of, or you live, uh, most of you, in the state of Oregon. I live in the state of Idaho, right? And because we live in the state of Idaho, in our state of Oregon, we are protected, and we have the right to protection under the full Constitution of the United States, meaning that we have due process, that we have the right to due process. We have the right to uh, speak when we want to. We have the right to carry our guns and to protect ourselves. We have the right, and I could go on. But according to them, and you have to understand this, when you're on federal controlled land, they deem it as U.S. territory and, and, that, and that they make all needful rules and regulations. They can give and they can take. Okay? And that's why we see these things happening. That's why all these regulations and all these rules, and they don't have to get, uh, they don't have to get legislation. That's why they can do all that they can do. That's what they believe. And it's our duty here as a people to understand that and to say, no, this is a state and no longer will allow you to, no longer will we allow
allow you to control the land and resources within the state. And then it takes care of all of those water issues, EPA issues, all of those things. It takes care of all of that. And it puts the, the, the power back into the, people's, into the people's hands. And it creates freedom. And we saw that at the Bundy Ranch. We have that example that it can be done. Okay? Any other questions or thoughts right now? I know I'm kind of rambling a little bit. I, I don't know if people here know that the state of Utah has a uh, water resource control board. Yeah. And they are in the process of demanding their land back as, as you're talking. And uh, I think it was just yesterday that the state school board or, or the school authorities said that they were for that. get into it a little bit more, there, there is some conflict there, um, but it, yes, did you have, but that is happening in Utah, yes. Uh, I'm new to the issue, so I'm learning a little bit more about it, uh, probably is a dumb question, but did the Hammonds violate Section 4 by crossing over into federal land? Uh, well, the federal thing is, territory, I should say. Well, the thing is, is one, the land is not Article 4 land, okay? okay that's that's my argument. The, the, uh, the land is what's called Article 1 land, meaning 1817. I mean, it's a state land, okay? But they did prosecute them as if it was Article 4 land. And yes, that's the thing is, is yes, they violated it. Uh, you know, all of us every day violate it. I mean, there's not a person in here that probably doesn't violate one of those laws every day. I, the Hammond property is surrounded by BLM property. Oh, which are public lands. Is that, a, is that an Article 4 thing then, or no? I'm glad you're asking the question. Does anybody want to answer that here? So he's saying, is, is the land that that is adjacent to the, the, the Hammonds Ranch, is it Article 4 land, or is it not? Who, anybody want to, I mean, that's what we're talking about, right? Yes. You know, if they haven't followed the steps that you laid out there, if they haven't, they didn't have the legislation approval or any of those things, if they didn't purchase it, then no. Yes, it's inside the border of the state, right? Yes. Uh, at what point did they actually cross that federal line? Who? The Hammonds. They never did. They did. Well, yeah, that's we're not, the point he's saying making. What we're trying to say is there is no federal line. Do we are in the state of Florida? Okay. Could I sure, make a stab that maybe they crossed that federal line inside of federal court? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, that's a good point. What happened there is they legitimized this unlawful act by entering into the court, by by trying to argue this issue in the court. And that's what, unfortunately, the American Land Council is doing the same thing, so I, I disagree with their their position because it's not constitutional. Although I, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm glad they're, they're, they're bringing the, the issue up, but we cannot allow ourselves to get sucked up into a federal court and expect to win. It yeah. will not happen. We have to stand, just like my dad eventually did, because what happened in 1993, my dad said, once he understood this, once he understood, he tried to get the other ranchers to, to, to follow. He, I mean, believe me, I remember my dad nearly begging the ranchers to make this stand, but they wouldn't. They wouldn't make it, because they were afraid of their, their, their words, you know, I can almost remember them as a young, young, young boy. If we stand against the most powerful government ever known to man, we will lose our ranches, we'll lose our, our heritage, we might even lose our lives. If we do this, we will lose. And my dad said, well, you have to, because it's the only way in which we have a stand. Okay? But they wouldn't. 
And so one by one, we watch them all, all be lose. lose, every single one of them, until my dad was the last one. And you have to understand, the stand that my dad said was, no longer am I going to pay the federal government to, to use my own rights. Okay? And no longer am I going to sign the federal government's contracts to use my own rights. Okay? And he made that, and he stopped signing the grazing contracts in 1993. Now, and he would not enter their courts. He would not enter their courts. They didn't know what to do with them. They never had anybody not try to and waste a million dollars. They didn't know what to do with them. So they ho hummed around for a long, long time. This is in 93. And in 2006, the federal agents got all of the local law enforcement together. And they said, what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to uh, designate Clive and Bundy as a domestic terrorist, and then we're going to try to charge him under domestic terrorist charges. Okay? That's what they, they said. But the thing is, is the good Lord was looking out for my dad that day, and my cousin, my first cousin, my dad's nephew, was in the room. He was, he was a county deputy. He was in the room, and they began to, the federal government began to say all these horrible things to demonize my dad and why he's a domestic terrorist. And my cousin let them just do it. And they went on for about an hour. They had a, a film, they had a, a PowerPoint presentation about how uh, bad and wicked my father is, right? And then about to, to the end, when they basically announced that they were going to declare Clive and Bundy as a domestic terrorist and charge him as a terrorist and then just basically throw him in prison and throw away the key, my cousin stood up and testified very clearly to everybody, which was about 100 people in the room, that his uncle, Cliven, was not a domestic terrorist. That he was a good man that loved his family, and all he wanted to do is to make a living a court the same way that his father, grandfather, and great-grandfather did. Right? And it ended it. It, it. it soured the whole meeting that they, they abandoned that idea at that time. Okay? And, it, and then they didn't know what, what to do. And then in 2012, they began to assemble and they actually looked like they were going to do what they were going to do in two, in what they did in 2014. But something happened. They actually, they actually came in uh, to Bunkerville. They, they occupied a multi-level hotel in Mesquite. And then, then they left. They left. I mean, they just left. We don't know what happened. Um, and then in 2014, they came in full force, 200 fully armed men, uh, threatened my family uh, that they would kill us. They actually used the words that if we resisted in any way, that they would, they, that this would be another Waco or Ruby Ridge. Okay. My point is, I guess I'm kind of getting a little off point because I wanted to bring back to the ranchers. Every one of the ranchers in Clark County lost their ranches. And their children, they, most of them had themselves had to move to the city because they, they had to make a living. Their children and their grandchildren are now living in these cities and don't even know what it's like to be on the land. And my dad begged them to stand. Every single one of them that would not stand on the constitutional principles in which I'm which I'm speaking about today, every single one of them lost their ranch. And there was only one rancher standing. One rancher left. That was my dad. And that was because he stood on these principles. They are right, they are pure, and they are the way to make sure that we defend our, our life, liberty, and pro property. It is the right way. And so what I'm suggesting here is that we stand on the Constitution. We stand on jurisdiction that they do not have authority to be administering the lands inside the state. Therefore, they need to leave the state and leave it to the people to do. And there's a lot to that, but really, it, it's really quite simple. And uh, and it's and that's what, that's why we we are we say and we have said for many many months now that. The Bundy Ranch is the freest place on earth. 
We truly, truly believe that. We are free to ranch. We are free to move about. We are a free people on that ranch. And that's because we stood on the correct principles and the people came around us. They defended us. And we went to ranching. And that's what we're doing. And I'm, I'm pleading with us, with you today, to do the same thing. Did, there's one more thing that I want to bring up, but did you have a comment? So I have a question now. Um, it sounds Ooh. like um, you're committed shows because the federal government has not infiltrated your ranch or tried to anymore, correct? So if, that, if that's true and we are behind the eight ball, as Tim has said, what's, what's the solution for the Hammonds? Because they're, they're in deep trouble. They are. So, so what, is, what is the solution as you see it? Well, so, I mean, I'll, I'll just be really, like I said, I told you I'd come clean with you. So this is me coming clean. Best I can.